It's Johnny Detroit Pregame.com. A uh, special series we're going to be starting called Wise Guy Series. So this is part one. You heard me talk a lot in the forums about offshore, Vegas, uh, contacts, professional betters. So I thought it was time to maybe put a, a face with that. And without going into last names, this is uh, Frank. I have tons of connections, certain ones for, say, basketball, certain ones for horse racing. And Frank, I like to call Grand Central Station. He's a guy that knows tons of people, tons of people in town, offshore, and when I need to get final clarification on something, I reach out to Frank. Frank, you've been in Vegas since 1965? Yeah, we got here in 65. I was just a little boy. Yeah, so I think we're going to do this in two parts. The first part, let's go into you. Like, when okay. you first got to Vegas, I mean, being here from 1965 till now, I mean, you're going through the mob times, the change to the corporation till today. So let's fast forward to you're old enough, you're 65, 1965, you're in Vegas. What's going on in town? Well, let's see, okay, I got here in 65, I was only five years old, and um, so I've seen everything in this town grow. You know, there used to be the little tiny independent sports books, all, all the tickets handwritten. When I was, I would say, 67 or 68, my dad used to like to um, play the games. We would park right outside the, you know, right outside the little places. He would run in, make his bet. I didn't know what he was doing right. until he started telling so me. So it's in your blood. It's in our blood, yeah. You know. Yeah, more or less. I've been, you know, I've seen it all. My father was a baccarat dealer, so uh, gaming has always been, you know, I've been involved in gaming my whole life. So you're growing up. Your dad's betting at the sports book. You're obviously in Vegas. You know, the prime time of the growth. The mobs here. All right. You start becoming a young man. You're becoming an adult. What's going on in your life at this time? No, now this is all I do. This is basically all I've done for the last eight or nine years is real serious. In the mid-80s to the mid-90s, I used to, we used to go to the casinos, you know, and just, you know, we'd find a game minus 140 at the Barbary Coast, walk across the street to Caesars and take plus 155 in baseball, little scalps. I actually stopped square betting, I would say, when I was about 23 or 24 years old because I just couldn't stand losing. Right. So when you say score betting, you know, just the nor you know, you would bet it, and you would, you know, lay three and a half, go with the public, you know, just like every single sharp person right. will always tell you at one point they were a square, they were a sucker, they were a square. I, I was we, doing videos yesterday, and I told the story how I was hustling my baseball yeah. cards in the locker room at school because right. I lost a couple hundred bucks and I thought my life was over. So, right. and, and that kind of was my epiphany of like, I want to be on the other team, or at least be on the team that's going to beat this guy, you know. Exactly. And then I hated losing by half a point, hated it. So that's how I got started. And I, and, and I, and I, didn't, I didn't like losing. I just so I said, I'm going to try to figure this out. And through the last um, 25 years, through everything in this industry is about information, especially now with the computers. For it's sure. Who you know, how, where, whether, um, how, which way the line's going to go, which players are okay. It, it's all information now. So, so take me back a little bit before the sports betting. Um, you know, we've talked a lot. We've had dinner before. Is you a professional card player? Not poker, though. No. You mean, well, you know, when, we were little, when I was 21, I learned how to count at blackjack. But, you know, that was tough. And, and you know, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Right. The juice wasn't worth the squeeze when you were um, in counting. But then I played poker a lot. And then you dealt poker. Well, I started dealing poker, and then I started playing poker. And you know a lot of the, the famous people that these guys are always yeah. talking about in the poker magazines. Name drop. T t give me a couple names. Oh, let me see. We dealt to all these guys. Right now, you know, when you walk through the Rio during the World Series of Poker, you see these black and white posters. They look like the Beatles coming through stuff. Right. We used to deal to these guys when they were uh, at the horseshoe. Looked like they just, you know, uh, rolled out of a motel, out of a motel three days ago. Same guys, just now they're glamorized and on TV. Right, so let's just do a couple of names. Uh, Doyle Brunson. No, not, not Doyle. Doyle was always pretty classy. He, was, he just minded his own business. But all the younger ones like the, um, well, I used to know Puggy Pearson. And, um, Good story on Puggy. Top there's your head. not too many as a, as a dealer and as a person. There's not too many good stories from him. Really? Oh no, there's not too many good stories. All right, from well, him. give me a bad story. Something within reason that our audience is <laughs> that they could handle. Puggy Pearson. Okay, here's the kind of guy that he knew you were a dealer. You were just trying to grind it out, make a hundred bucks a day. Here's the kind of guy that, on a continuous basis, 
absolutely, you were guaranteed to get zero. Always guaranteed to get zero. And one time at the water cooler, I go to the water cooler, you know, on my, on my break as a, as a dealer, and I overhear, uh, you know, talking to another friend of his saying, listen, the first guy that tips the dealer has to pay the other two of us $100. They had side bets. The first guy that tipped the dealer had to pay his other buddies $100 each. This, and, and, he, and he wanted the game ran perfect. Right. And he wanted everything. But, he, but, no, you know, but no tips. No. Was he the one who threw the chocolate bar? No, that was uh, who threw the t uh, Clark bar. Hit a friend of mine in the middle of the forehead with a Clark bar because, you know, he gave him a bad card on the end. Like, we have no control. Right. And uh, he didn't get barred or anything. This, you know, you're talking like 1980 now. They tolerated a lot from these players. The dealers really got the worst of it. Now, the dealers, it's like, um, they should be in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> they, it is, it is. You know, they, it, they have it perfect. You cannot abuse the dealers now. Chip Reese. Chip Reese, not too much on him. He was always quiet and pretty classy. He was, Stu Unger. Stu Unger, kind of a, you know, kind of a, a brat, but he did tip, and, he, and I mean, he, he tipped, and he, um, no, he was okay. So. so if I had to say one story, if you could epitomize a great story in, a, say, a minute and a half. On poker? Poker table, know. yep. All the years you're dealing. I mean, there's so many people that, you know, on these 2 plus 2 forums, watching high stakes poker, that, you know, they see what people want to see. You were there in the trenches in the beginning when it was those eight guys in one MTC waiting to take the money from some tourists, you know. Poker yeah. wasn't like it is now where there's no. poker rooms everywhere. So one good poker story. One good poker story. Okay, it's over at the Silverbird. And, uh, Silverbird. I, I don't know if you know the Silverbird. <laughs> Not the Venetian poker room, but the Silverbird. Okay, so we're at the but, Silverbird. But then this is, this is a true story. So my friend uh, Joe Guzzo was the floor man. And actually, on the last card, as, as a dealer dealt the last card to him, he looked at his cards and he slumped over. He slumped over and, you know, it was his turn to act. And Joe kept, Joe kept budging him like this. And it was, a, it was a pretty nice sized pot. And this was the first time that actually Joe had to look at the deal and say, he's got a dead hand. He, he, he actually died at the table. At the table. At the table, he actually had a, a dead hand. You know how we always say it's a dead hand? <laughs> he really did. Was, so who, who won the pot? It was the, the, only, the only other guy. He, the guy had a, a, he, he, and that, that's the truth. At the silver board, the guy died at, uh, in, on the last card. So if I had to say, tell me your best story involving a well-named poker pro. Gosh, a well-known pro. See. Should I drop it? Can I use his name? I don't care. Uh, no. <laughs> as long as it's nothing he's going to sue us over. I mean, I think people want, yeah. you know, this is poker I, history. I would say if for the, all the people that see these guys walking through and, you know, playing the World Series and thinking like they're these superstars, half of these guys were okay anyways. But be, before the World Series and all the glamour, these, these guys were really probably some of the lowest forms of life that um, we had. Any cheating? No, no, there wasn't too much cheating because you got the Vegas camera. They would, at that point, though. Collusion. In, yeah, in some of the places there was collusion in the high-low games. They would, uh, you know, get in and find the tours, put them in the middle, but, you know. And bang them out. Right. That was, that's 1980 stuff, though. So I'll say, okay, sports better. I'm going to fast forward to and we'll get to part two. What other, any other casino games or anything that you, being in Vegas, you were excelled at to make money? Gambling. No, well... No, no, briefly in the video poker, but you know that was took a lot of time, and I, the the return wasn't worth the time. You play highlight though. Yeah, I played pro highlight at MGM. I was Perez number twenty nine. Really? Yeah, I, I won the eighty two singles championship here. I won the seventy eight championship at MGM in Reno. You play anymore? No, I retired in eighty three. Really? Yeah. So you you're dealing poker to the guys that everyone's watching on TV. You're one of the best highlight players in the world. You've been here since the 60s. Yeah. And, and now you're betting sports professionally for how long? Oh, I've been making, a, I would say, really professionally and um, making a large profit, I'd say, the last 11 years. So before we go into part two and we fast forward to, you know, within the last 11 years, we'll say, for a lot of people who don't live in Vegas, I mean, this is something that's more, you know, common to you, is you take that 60s era with, you know, the mob controlled, you know, you, you watch the old school movies right. versus now where it's this, you know, this big corporate empire and pirate ships doing battle in 10,000, you know, room casinos. Which era do you like better, today 
or back in the 60s and 70s, mid 80s? No, I, I like to, I'm back then. It was, a, it was a great town to grow up in. And really, when these guys had a gaming license, it's because they, they deserved they it. They deserved it. Because they let you bet. Right now, you know, back then, over at the Stardust and Little Caesars and everything, you could, uh, you wanted to bet 20000 on a game, 30000 on a game. They took it, no problem. Wrote it on a piece of paper, thank you, see you later. Gave you a comp for three to the steakhouse. Now, you try to go bet $2,000 on a game, you have to have, you know, uh, their player's card, all control, uh, they don't. They don't want no no gambling. Now. Yeah, there's some places that limit you guys to what 500 on yeah, NBA they, totals, and some they, they should, don't even let you bet. Absolutely, they shouldn't even have a gaming license. They should have a 501c3. Donate. Just like yeah, just you know, a nonprofit. They they just want donations. Um, meanwhile, they're backed by you know 4,000 slot machines, 3,000 room towers, and and they're scared of a guy that I just want to bet a thousand dollars on an on an NBA game. Is that okay? One one of your partners made a, a comment to me one time, and he said that he actually was told by one of the floor guys on the side that the uppers basically, if you could think, they don't want you betting. And that, oh. is, is that what this town has become for sports bettors? Yeah, for the absolutely. Most part. I mean, I understand with the internet and the information sources right now, they gotta be a little bit more careful, but they have absolutely no gambling whatsoever. They just want, you know, all square players betting $50 parlays and uh, dumb teeth. They just, they don't, they, don't want to, they don't want nobody to win. Well. We're going to fast forward to part two and close out this segment. Um, Vegas history, I mean, you're talking the 60s. I mean, you've been through it all, 11 years of professional betting. So we'll be back with part two of the Wise Guys series with me and Mr. X, Johnny Detroit and Frank. So check back part two.